JBS presents a television exclusive, The Der Show with Alan Dershowitz. Welcome back to The Der Show. We got a lot of really good reaction to yesterday's uh, July 4th uh, special podcast where I went over the founding documents of American history, the letter from George Washington, the Declaration of Independence that still sits behind me, um, and and other uh, uh, letters and books and documents uh, uh, founding the country on July 4th. I enjoyed doing it, and apparently you'll see from some of the letters later, uh, lots of other people enjoyed it. Uh, as well, uh, today we, we, we move overseas and we cross the Atlantic Ocean. And um, we moved to Israel, where the United States uh, recently did a forensic study and came to some conclusions about who killed uh, the Palestinian journalist, uh, Shireen Abu Akleh. Um, um, but just to coordinate with yesterday's show, I will show you, this is also a Declaration of Independence. This is Israel's Declaration of Independence, uh, an original um, copy of the announcement that was made uh, in 1948 um, uh, declaring independence from Great Britain, uh, much the way the United States declared independence from Great Britain. And uh, to, to also put Israel in context, uh, my new book has just come out, uh, The Price of Principle. And the first blurb on the back of the new book is, Mazel Tov to Allen for his important 50th book about the frightening devolution from principle to partisanship. And then he says, in my inaugural address, I spoke about the dangers of political polarization and about the critical importance of dialogue and genuine respect for the other. I hope that Alan Dershowitz's book fosters an honest dialogue that enriches rather than costs jobs, reputations, and even friendships. Uh, signed, Isaac Herzog, the president of uh, the state of Israel. So I was very, very pleased with that and pleased with the fact that this is my my 50th book. So. What happened? Um, as you know, um, a bunch of terrorists uh, killed um, dozens of Israeli civilians over the past several months, uh, children, uh, women, um, old men. Um, they used knives, uh, guns, uh, ran people with cars. Um, and there's absolutely no justification for targeting civilians and, and, and killing them. And um, many of them came from a particular city on, on the West Bank. And so Israel sent troops to the city um, to arrest uh, the perpetrators, the murderers, the mass murderers, people who had killed so many terrorists, as any country would do. The United States would certainly do the same. We did it with... Uh, Obviously, um, many terrorists over the years, we've killed them, we've captured them, etc. So Israel sent troops. And instead of just allowing um, the troops to go and have search warrants or do it, whatever they do to try to capture the, the, the terrorist the criminals, um, Palestinian militia members shot back at them. And there was an exchange of fire um, back and forth. And... Um, and, and the journalist, um, Shireen Abu uh, Akhle, uh, uh, was killed. Uh, she was shot in the head by a bullet. The bullet uh, then hit her helmet. She was wearing a, a helmet. Um, she died. The bullet was removed from her head. And there was a big fight about who would examine the bullet. The Palestinians first claimed the bullet proved that it was shot from an Israeli gun. Uh, the Americans said, show it to us. The Palestinians said, no. The Israelis said, let us examine it. You can hold it, but let us examine it. And if we conclude it was shot from an Israeli gun, all right. Uh, but if we conclude it wasn't, uh, we'll announce that. Finally, on the eve of um, President Biden's going to the Middle East and meeting both with Palestinian and Israeli leaders, uh, the Palestinian Authority allowed the bullet to be examined forensically. And the forensic examination came to the conclusion that it was impossible to tell whether it was fired by Palestinians or by Israelis. That the bullet, because it hit the helmet, became so deformed that it couldn't be forensically matched with any type of gun, certainly not with any particular gun. And so the United States came to three conclusions. Number one, it was impossible to determine um, 
the source of the bullet, whether it came from an Israeli gun or from a Palestinian gun. Number two, that's the location of the shooters, the uh, where the shooters were, where the Israeli troops were, where the Palestinian um, uh, terrorists and militiamen were, makes it likely but not certain that the bullet probably likely came from the Israeli side rather than the Palestinian side. And then they came to their third and most important conclusion that the evidence overwhelmingly shows that uh, whoever uh, um, fired the shot, uh, the killing of the journalist was completely accidental. She was not targeted. Um, there was no intent to kill her. Uh, there was no knowledge that um, by shooting, um, uh, it was a result in the death of a journalist. It was just an accident. Journalists who deliberately get into harm's way, as they do in Ukraine, as they do as they did in Afghanistan, as they did in many parts of the world. Uh, dozens and dozens of journalists are killed every year, um, but rarely does it make the front page uh, and, and the top news as it does when Israel is involved, because Israel gets exceptional, extraordinary, unprecedented attention from the media, from the international community, whatever it does, whether it does wrong, whether it does right, or whether it does something that's inconclusive. And so um, the most important conclusion the, the, the investigation made was that it was not a deliberate shooting, that it was an accidental shooting. It was a tragedy, not, not a crime. And that should end the matter, but it didn't. Uh, the Palestinians rejected that finding and said, no, 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 this is part of a long-term policy of Israel, always targeting uh, journalists and killing them uh, deliberately. Not a word about terrorists targeting Israeli children, babies, mothers, um, grandparents. Not a word about that, but uh, the claim that Israel targets uh, Palestinian uh, journalists. Uh, that's obviously not true. There's no evidence to support the claim that they ever, ever targeted. And nobody's ever proved it. And nobody's ever even presented any evidence of it. But that evidence is not important to the Palestinian leadership. They will always blame Israel for everything. Um, they blame Israel for not having a state when Israel offered them a state in 1948, 1967, 1990, 2000, 2001, 2005, 2008. They uh, turned it down every time. The Palestinians don't know how to take yes for an answer, yet they blame their lack of statehood on, on Israel. The Kurds have never been offered a state. Uh, the uh, people of China who uh, have been uh, discriminated against um, because of their Muslim faith have never been offered independence, but Palestinians have. But in any event, they blame it completely on on, on Israel. This will make uh, Biden's trip to uh, the Middle East a little harder because he's going to um, get a lot of criticism for, for the American study. Now, nobody claims the American study was biased or fair, and uh, I think the people who did the study, it was announced by the State Department, are perfectly happy to show uh, journalists and the Palestinians their sources and the information. Um, there are no secrets here. There's no national security uh, involved. Uh, it's a forensic examination. And the forensic examination concluded that uh, there was no evidence whatsoever that the shot was fired deliberately. To the contrary, the evidence is overwhelming that it was just an accident and that it, uh, it could have happened. Uh, uh, and of course, the real cause of it, uh, putting aside the forensics, the real cause, of course, is the fact that uh, Palestinian uh, shooters, uh, militia people, terrorists, um, didn't allow Israel to engage in a proper arrest um, and shot back. Uh, imagine the context of an American situation. Let's assume there is a terrorist hiding out in downtown Chicago, having shot 10 people, um, and the police uh, go in uh, to try to arrest him, stop him, um, um, and instead of uh, the local folks in Chicago, say members of the Crips or Crits or some instead of them allowing the police to go in <clears throat> and arrest the suspect or interrogate the suspect, they begin to shoot at the police and, uh, and the police shoot back. <clears throat> and in the course of that exchange of fire, uh, a Chicago Tribune journalist who happens to be covering the event and purposely put herself or himself in harm's way, gets shot and killed. It really doesn't matter whose gun the bullet came from. The, the people who shot at the police are at fault. By the way, that's the law as well as morality. Under the felony murder rule, which I taught for 50 years, if you have an exchange of fire 
um, and uh, felons uh, shoot at police officers and the police officers shoot back. And in the course of that fusillade, uh, a police officer accidentally kills an innocent civilian. Guess who's guilty of felony murder? Not the police officer, but the criminals who fired at the police, causing the police to fire back. That's the law of felony murder. It was a case in Pennsylvania called the Red Line case, which is one of the leading cases on that. But there are cases all over the states that make the same uh, ruling. So under American law, under the law of almost every other uh, state, uh, those who start uh, the felony of shooting at police are responsible for the death, regardless of whose gun the fatal bullet uh, came from. So you would think that would end the matter, but it, it hasn't ended the matter and it won't end the matter. The Palestinians simply will not accept the conclusion of the United States. They can't point to any evidence uh, to the contrary, but uh, again, evidence is not what's necessary. So I think President Biden's trip to the Middle East will, will not be uh, um, as productive um, as it could have been, but for this um, a tragedy. And it is, uh, it is a, a tragedy. And uh, I would hope that President Biden would speak to both sides and tell the Israelis, look, even though this wasn't your fault, um, maybe look hard at your rules of engagement and see whether there's anything that can be done to avoid the possibility of this ever happening again. That would be a good thing. Nobody wants a journalist to be killed. Nobody wants an innocent person to be killed. And then he has to turn to the Palestinians and say, you got to stop terrorists from coming into Israel and murdering civilians. And you have to stop terrorists in Janine and other places from preventing Israeli police and Israeli armed forces from enforcing the law, which they're entitled to do to stop terrorists. And you certainly have to stop your pay to slave policy. Um, today, the Palestinians essentially pay terrorists to kill um, Jews. Um, they offer them money. They offer the family money. Um, they make heroes out of them. They in streets after them. Um, that's called inciting terrorism. Um, that clearly is something that contributes mightily to the terrorism around the world. Imagine how we would feel if terrorists who targeted the United States were paying, paying the terrorists to do it and rewarding them. Uh, and if they were killed, as many Palestinian terrorists are in the course of um, killing Israelis, their families are rewarded. They're, they're given homes, they're given money, they're paid stipends, uh, their posters are made of them, streets are named after them. That only will increase terrorism. Now, some people call it a cycle of violence. It's not a cycle of violence. It's a one-way street. It's not a cycle. It's a straight line. The Palestinians cause the violence. They are the ones who engage in terrorism. Um, you know, as Benjamin Netanyahu once said, and he was absolutely correct when he said this, if uh, the Palestinians put down their arms, there would be peace. If Israel puts down its arms, there would be genocide. Does anybody doubt that? Does anybody doubt that if Israelis gave up their armed forces, there would be genocide? The first thing is the Iranians would come in and, and bomb them. They've sworn to do it. Uh, Palestinian terrorists, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, they all uh, have sworn the destruction of Israel. None of them want a two-state solution. They don't even want a one-state solution. They want a no-state solution. They don't want there to be a nation state for the Jewish people. It's okay to have a Muslim state of Palestine, which is governed by Sharia law. Israel isn't, isn't, isn't a Jewish state. It's the nation state of the Jewish people. There's a difference. It doesn't operate under Jewish law. Uh, halacha, Jewish law, uh, isn't the governing principles. Israeli law is based on American law, German law, um, uh, Roman law, it's a system of law, much like the American system of law. Um, is it inspired uh, by religion? Have shall not kill is in the Bible. And yes, the Israelis have a law of murder. So does the United States. So does the Palestinian Authority. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's so complicated uh, and so difficult. And 
the idea of calling it a cycle of violence when it all starts with terrorism from the Palestinians. Look, just go back in time to 19, 1947 when the United Nations uh, proposed the division of what was then mandatory Palestine controlled by the British into a tiny little, tiny little state for the Jewish people, tiny state just on the coastline. Even Jerusalem was not going to be part of Israel. It was going to be an international city. And the rest of the arable land of all of the mandate would go to uh, a Palestinian state, the second Palestinian state. There already was one. It was called Jordan, um, which is comprised primarily of Palestinians. So the Palestinians said no. The Israelis said yes. Uh, they would have had a state. Then they would have had a state in 67. Then they would have had a state in 90. They would have had a state in 2000, a state in 2001, a state in 25, 208. They could have a state today if they just sat down and negotiated. Uh, the new prime minister of Israel is a liberal um, who would love to see a two-state uh, solution. But the Palestinians have never uh, accepted um, uh, any conditions uh, for a two-state solution. And so it continues. And the uh, manifestation most recently of this unwillingness to compromise and accept truth has been the unwillingness of the Palestinian to accept the conclusions uh, by the United States. Every American should be insulted. Every American should be upset that the Palestinians, to whom we give so much money every year, um, uh, refuse to accept the conclusions of uh, an American forensic examination announced by uh, the State Department. But that's, uh, that's the way it is. Um, I know I'm going to get some bigoted emails about this. And, uh, you know, anytime you mention anything relating to Jews or Israel, the, the bigots uh, uh, creep out from under the rocks. But I hope there will be people there who will be thoughtful and 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 really understand that um um the fault here is uh, in one direction is israel faultless no of course not is any country faultless is the united states faultless i love america you you saw it yesterday with my uh, adoration of uh, america's founders uh, uh, even though they were obviously not without flaw jefferson probably primary among them but even washington um although he was one of the most anti-slave founding fathers, was not without flaw on that, on that subject. Uh, he did own some slaves, and his wife owned some slaves as well. He liberated them upon his death, but that, that's not good enough by today's standards, and it shouldn't be good enough by, by any standards. But uh, you don't expect perfection. Perfection is the enemy of good. Um, Israel is a very good country. It's contributed enormously to the welfare of the world in the 70, what, four years now since its establishment. It's, it's contributed so much medically, scientifically, uh, in literature and music, and, and most importantly, in teaching the world how to fight terrorism while maintaining due process and uh, striking an appropriate balance between the need to stop terrorists and the need to preserve fairness, due process, and and liberty. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a supporter of, of Israel. I'm also a critic of some of its policies, as I am of some of the policies of the United States. But uh, um, uh, on this issue, on the issue of the killing of the journalists, the fault is almost entirely on the Palestinian side uh, for uh, having their uh, militia people and their terrorists fire at Israeli soldiers who are uh, acting lawfully and legitimately and proportionately, and the result of which was the tragedy of this woman uh, being killed. A great memorial to her life and her death um, would be if the Palestinians would stop encouraging and inciting terrorism, and then we would have fewer and fewer deaths, including fewer deaths of, of journalists. So let's turn now to some of the letters um, uh, from yesterday. And, and yesterday's letters are are quite remarkable because they actually contain some praise. I mean, mostly the letters are, you know, you pedophile, you Jew, uh, you know, you this, you that. Uh, either you're, we can't listen to you because you voted for Trump or, or because you defended Trump, or we can't listen to you because you voted for Biden. You know, nobody wants to listen if they don't agree with everything you've done. Today, it's a little different. Um, and 
And let's see what some of these letters have said. Um, okay, here's, here's an interesting one. Thank you so much, Professor, for sharing your treasures with us and for, ex for exuding your love of country on the 4th of July. I also appreciate your uh, reassertion of putting principle of a politics. That's my new book. Uh, that is the essence of productive discussions and debate that keeps the U.S. strong. A rare, a rare uh, praising letter. Uh, Mr. Dershowitz, happy July 4th. You are one of the few people that understand the American constitutional history and how a republic should function as it's meant to function. Caveat, defending the U.S. Constitution is no doubt making you a lot of powerful enemies, I have to tell you. Today, uh, defending the Constitution can get you canceled, literally can get you canceled uh, at universities. If you say equal protection, oh, no, 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 we don't want equal protection. We want preferences. We want preferences based on race. And if you talk about equal or meritocratic or any of that, you're, you're, you're canceled. Um, Dersha may not agree with you on some things, but you're a great American with a passion for truth. Please do more episodes on the history or legal history to educate me and bring us together. Have a great fourth. A lot of those. Uh, one, not really in a patriotic mood. Lincoln himself couldn't salvage this mess. I don't know. Uh, he, did a, he did a pretty good job uh, in salvaging the mess that resulted um, in the Civil War. You know, I often wonder what would have happened if the South had been just a bit smarter and hadn't attacked Fort Sumter, but simply had the state legislatures in each of the states say, we hereby declare ourselves independent from the United States of America. Somebody could have written an interesting Declaration of Independence, one in the course of human events, it becomes necessary, you know, and it goes on and on and on and on. And, on. And, and, and what would have happened if they had simply all decided to leave, but no, no firing? Would Lincoln have sent troops? That, it's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, uh, okay, another person praised the show. I have some questions. I always understood that Hamilton could never run for president because he was not born in the United States. Uh, um, no, uh, that's not true. Uh, all the first um, handful of presidents were not born in the United States. Washington was not born in the United States. He was born in, you know, colonial England. Um, um, Adams, Jefferson, Madison. I don't recall, some of you will, and I'm sure I'll get letters on this, who the first, was it Tyler? The first president who was actually born in the United States, that is born subsequent to 1776, because all presidents born prior to 1776 were not born in the United States. And the constitutional rule is not a geographic one. Uh, it's not were you born in what became the United States. It was born in the United States. And the Constitution provides for you can be the president uh, up until up until. Uh, a certain point. Um, so that's that's an interesting historical question. Um, I'm on the opposite side of the aisle, but I could visit with you for days. So interesting, and that this is coming from an uneducated small business owner that loves to think. You're not uneducated. You may not have a formal education, but you sound to me very educated. And if you like to think you're educated, I think therefore I am, uh, is a famous statement by a famous uh, philosopher, uh, Descartes, and um, you think, therefore, you're educated. That's, to me, the definition of education. Um, we were lucky back then that smallpox vaccine did more good than harm. If it killed soldiers, it would be even more likely there would be no America. Past luck does not guarantee future luck. Totally wrong as a matter of science. The uh, smallpox vaccine, vaccine was much more dangerous, uh, much more likely to kill than current uh, vaccines, and some soldiers did die. As a result of taking the vaccines, look, there's no free lunch. Um, there are no medical procedures. I just had a medical procedures. This has my, been my year for medical procedures. And, um, the doctors know I'm a lawyer, so they always start with a list of, oh, this could happen, this could happen, that could happen. No, thank God, none of it, none of it happened to, to me yet. But um, there's no such thing as a risk-free um, uh, uh, medical procedure, whether it be a vaccine or anything else. It's a, a matter of cost-benefit analysis, and nobody should be forced to undergo medical treatment that is designed to benefit them. But 
just today when I was on the way to my doctor to have a checkup, we got into the elevator in the hospital is a big sign. You must wear masks. Masks are not uh, not permissive. They're mandatory. And there was a guy in the elevator standing right next to us that wasn't wearing a mask. And so my wife very politely said, sir, could you he had the mask, but it was on. It was tucked in. Could you please put the mask on your face? And another guy who was wearing a mask starts screaming at me, oh, what are you doing? You're trying to rule the world. You can't tell us what to do for our own good. And I said, I'm not interested in your own good. Uh, I'm interested in my good. Uh, I'm not interested in whether you're protected by wearing a mask. That's your business. I'm interested in whether I'm protected by your wearing the mask. Oh, you're trying to control the world, et cetera. That, you know, that attitude still prevails. People don't understand that the mask and the vaccine are not intended only to protect the person wearing the mask and getting the vaccine. Otherwise, I would not defend it. It would be, in my view, if not unconstitutional, certainly in, in, inconsistent with John Stuart Mill's approach to liberty, which is an approach I take. But um, because masks and vaccines are designed to protect other people, um, um, I generally think people should have them. But whether they should be compelled or not depends on circumstances. I wrote a book about that, too, the case for vaccine mandates, which was obviously controversial and would be controversial with many of my, many of my viewers and listeners. Um, this is related to that. I wonder how that paragraph about inoculation, you know, the Washington letter had a paragraph, how important it is to inoculate the troops. Might have been different if it was Jefferson who had Washington's ear instead of Hamilton. It's a fascinating question. Hamilton was, of course, um, much more conservative by today's standards. Uh, it's very hard to judge who's a liberal, who's conservative, but uh, was much more conservative than Hamilton um, and, and more of a libertarian than Hamilton. So I, I'm not sure I know the answer. I suspect I think it would have been the same, but I'm not positive. See you next week. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.